Hey there, Modern World History students. This is Velasquez, and we're ready to continue our discussion of World War I this week. And this week's flip lecture, I want to go ahead and start digging in uh, to our discussion of World War I, specifically focusing on the Western Front. So before we get started, I thought we'd start off with a quote on the screen, just to kind of pause and reflect. And the quote says, in late summer of 1914, Sir Edward Grey wrote, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. And before we start off today, I want to remind you guys that by 1914, Europe at this point was divided into two rival camps. One alliance, reminder, we talked about was the Triple Entente. And the Triple Entente included Great Britain, France, and Russia. The other was known as the Triple Alliance. And this included Germany, Austria, Hungary, and also Italy. Now, last week we talked about, again, an event in history known as the Spark, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his pregnant wife, Sophie, which were gunned down in the streets. Reminder, in any given day, that was just a tragic, tragic um, murder. However, because of this system of tangled alliances, we're going to see that by one by one, each of our countries is going to join in and support uh, each other alliances, and before we know it, again, World War I will begin. All right, so war breaks out. So I just put kind of a breakdown just to kind of, you know, it gets a little complicated. And we call this these events, the series, right, the chain reaction, or the way I like to think of it, right, is the domino effect. Basically, when you're a little kid, right, you stacked up the dominoes, and you probably made them little patterns. Maybe they go up the table and down the stairs, right? And all you need to do once they're all perfectly set in line is just tip over one domino and then whoop, the whole thing sort of falls into place. So we know that again, Austria-Hungary is going to seek revenge again for the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Reminder again, he was next in line, heir in the throne. And we're going to see that Austria-Hungary declare war on Serbia. Now Serbia again, <clears throat> we looked at last week, right? Responsible for organizations such as the Black Hand, Gavrilo Princip was the assassin. And in response to Austria's declaration of war, Russia, Serbia's ally began moving the army towards the Russian-Austrian border. So expecting Germany to join Austria, Russia also mobilized along the German border. To Germany, Russia's mobilization amounted pretty much as a declaration of war. And on August 1st, the German government declared war on Russia. I'm going to have you put that in your pocket, so to speak, right? August 1st, the German government declared war in Russia. That's going to kind of come into play later on when we start looking at the close of the war. Um, but when we look to Russia, right, Russia now is going to look to its ally France for help. Germany, however, did not even wait for France to react. So two days after declaring war in Russia, Germany also declared war in France. Soon after, Great Britain declared war in Germany and then pretty much much of Europe was ready to sort of lock into battle. All right, let's go ahead and take it back to the document. So you can see on the screen right now, again, in the black, which is the Triple Alliance, and the light gray is the Triple Entente. Um, so by mid-August, about 1914, pretty much we could see the battle lines are clearly drawn. On one side, we had Austria-Hungary and Germany, and we're going to see that they're shifting again. They're going to be known as the Central Powers. Now, I think you can understand why they're called the Central Powers, right, when you look at the map. Pretty much their location is the center or the heart of Europe. So Bulgaria and later the Ottoman Empire would later join the Central Powers in hopes to regain some lost territory. Remember, also in our last uh, flip lecture, we talked about the Ottoman Empire was um, sort of losing some of its power, I should say, especially in that area that we talked about known as the Balkan Peninsula. Um, so the Ottomans saw this as a, a chance to kind of reconquer some of that land. So on the other side, we have the triple, um, or I should say, not the triple, um, the other side, we have Great Britain, France, and Russia. So together, those, um, that team is going to merge, and it's going to be referred to the Allied Powers or the Allies. Now, Japan joined the Allies within weeks, um, and then Italy joined later. So the interesting the thing about Italy is Italy had been a member of the Triple Alliance with Germany, Austria, Hungary, but the Italians joined the actual other side after accusing their former partners of unjustly starting the war, right? They basically say, you know what, that was kind of, you know, messed up. We, we don't back what you're doing here. And so Italy kind of bails out. 
Also, at least side note, is also is very similar looking for some more territory, right? Especially look along the Adriatic coast or the Adriatic Sea. Um, so as much as, again, part of these alliances, right, is just helping about your friend. Um, also part of these alliances we see, of course, is the country thinks it's something for them, whether they're going to get more power, whether, again, they're going to get more territory in that case. All right, so when we start to see the development, right, once war is broken out, you can see, looking at the map, again, spatially thinking, um, the central powers are kind of in a, in a tough spot, right, Germany especially. So Germany, you can see, is basically fighting um, its enemies on both sides, right? On the eastern, this side, right, they have conflict with Russia. If you cruise over here to the west, okay, their borders along with France, so basically, again, you have enemies on both sides. So um, I don't think you have to be a military strategist, right? It's very difficult. You, the last thing you want to do, right, is divide your forces. Uh, you don't want to put half your army over here and half your army over here, right? That's going to weaken your force. And especially when we talk about the German army, which is for a, quite some time, again, extremely strong. Um, the Reich, the empire, right, even in the time of period of imperialism, one of our documents, right, um, that in document B for the DBQ, right, was talking about German must again rise to that colonial power, right, have that strength, that military power. But I digress. My point in this visual is that what Germany is faced in doing is it needs to think about a plan. So Germany developed something, a strategy called the Schieflin Plan, and it was named after its designer, Jennifer Schieflin. Um, and the plan basically called for attacking and defeating France on the West and then rushing over to fight Russia in the East. So the Germans felt that they could carry out the plan because um, Russia lagged behind the rest of Europe, especially like in transportation when we look at railroad systems. And it would take Russia a longer time, right, to mobilize. It would basically take a longer for Russia to mobilize to really sort of, you know, defend its eastern front. So the mindset was, hey, we can hightail it to France. Okay, we're going to defeat them. And then we'll turn our attention back to the eastern front. So early on, it appeared that Germany was going to do that. And right around in the fall, about September or so, they kind of swept into, um, into Paris or into France, I should say. Now, the tricky thing with this is we're going to see that when this is occurring, we see that Germany is going to be sort of finding a shortcut, right? Um, does it make sense to go around, okay, or kind of, you know, cross enemy lines? Or again, this tiny little country right here, which is the country of Belgium, seems to be in the way. So Germany decides, Germany, I should say, decides to march right through and sort of, uh, you know, flank and try to attack Paris. That's a strategy early on. Strategy was the moment when the war plan took effect. Nowhere was this clearer than in Germany, for Germany had become the prisoner of her plan. The Schlieffen plan had existed since 1905. General Field Marshal Count Alfred von Schlieffen, chief of staff for 18 years, had devoted his mind to one problem the danger to Germany created by the Franco-Russian agreement. War on two fronts, east and west. He assumed that the Russian giant would move slowly. The French might move fast. His answer to the problem was simple. Smash the French before the Russians entered the field. So one army, only 250,000 men, would join the Austrians to contain the Russian threat. Seven armies over one and a half million men would fall on France. By sheer weight and speed, they would beat her to her knees in 40 days and then turn eastward. The difficulty was how to get at France. A strong line of well-planned fortresses lay along the frontier. Von Schlieffen's answer was couched in the grand manner. He would outflank the French. He would march through Belgium, trample on neutrality. Not only that, he would send the bulk of his army through Belgium. A mere handful would face the French along the frontier, and all the rest, over a million men, would go for a vast encirclement of the French army. Through Brussels, southwestwards across the Seine, round Paris itself, 
then eastward towards Germany again to attack the French forces from behind. Now von Schlieffen was dead, but the whole vast apparatus of his plan was poised to move. All right, so we can see right here, again, the Schieffen plan is significant, right? Put into place originally, again, the mindset for the Germans, right? Attack France, hit them hard, flank them, again, attack them first. And then once they are tackled, right, the mindset is to push your troops over to the Eastern Front. Um, as you can imagine, folks, um, internationally, right, Belgium had never been in our conversation of allies, so basically what we have is a case where Germany marched through a neutral country, meaning it had no allegiance or alliance. Um, and again, we can imagine, right, international law prohibits that, right? So we can see not only does Germany take action, right, and they could use the argument, of course, all fairs and uh, all is fair in war. However, many people are, are pretty shocked and angered by the fact that Germany feels it had the right to basically just march literally through um, Belgium. So you can see right an example of the you know political cartoon, right? Poor little Belgium standing there trying to hold off the German advancement. Um, but ultimately, again, this is when we see um, the establishment of the Western Front. Now, when we set up the Western Front, um, battles to take a look at in this case, one thing to note, um, you're going to see when we see um, the beginning of World War I, early September, right? Fighting did not go as quickly as Germany had anticipated. One of the first major battles that we see um, sort of northeast of Paris in the valley of the Marne River, uh, the Battle of Marne, um, it was a bloody battle that lasted for about four days, but ultimately it was the battle in which the Germans were treated. Now, that is significant because not only it was the first major clash, the first major, major battle, the Battle of Marne, um, it's probably one of the single most important events of the war because this basically proved the Schieffelin plan was not going to work. Right? The fact that Germans already retreated is going to show, okay, we're not just going to knock them out in 40 days. A quick victory to the west was no longer possible. In the east, Russian forces were already riding to trying to invade Germany, and the Germans were going to have to basically fight a war on two fronts. So realizing this, the German command officials, right, they send troops to France to aid forces, um, and then we really start seeing basically uh, the establishment we call it as a stalemate. So a stalemate is basically, right, think of it like a stale loaf of bread, just sitting there, right, it's going bad. So in early 1915, both pretty much the Western Front um, was use, use, utilizing, I should say, a new strategy of warfare, which was known as trench warfare. Now, you can imagine, right, from far, far, 